NRL round two, New Zealand Warriors up against the Melbourne Storm over in Melbourne. This is going to be a tough one for the Warriors. A few battered bodies here off the back of a round one loss to the Sharks. Let's take a look how this one plays out. Hey team, welcome back into the Warrior Holic. Another round, another chance to get our season off and running after a tough bloody loss here against the Sharks on Friday night. But proud that the boys stuck in it for 80 minutes and almost had a chance to snatch it at the end there. But this is going to be one of the toughest games of the season. A number of guys still struggling with injuries. One of the opposition that we're least successful against in the entire history of the NRL. Melbourne Storm in Melbourne. It's going to be 27 degrees on Saturday, so it'll be a warm one. But after a couple of days with a lot of fears that we might be having some uh, big changes there, maybe even a debut, turns out we're starting with the same 17 we had against the Sharks. So quick delve into the history here. Uh, since 1995, we've played 49 times. Storm's winning 31, 16 to us in the two draws. So like I said, we're struggling against these guys, especially over there in Melbourne. Um, we went close last year, but for a few injuries and a few dodgy calls. Here's hoping that given these guys might be back from injury, this could be a chance for us to break that drought. But it's going to be a bloody tough one. So the Storm coming off uh, the back of a win there against the Panthers. I only had a chance to watch the highlights, but looking through the stats, they may have done bloody well on defense to hold out the Panthers, but the Panthers were far from clinical. A lot of errors from them, but 15 errors from the Storm last week, so... They were far from clinical themselves, only managing to score the one try. So, you know, you could see that as a positive that they only let in, or they didn't let in any tries, but they didn't score too many points themselves, you know, botching a whole bunch of opportunities. So we got the two tries. Um, we probably botched a half a dozen. So I think we've kind of gone into this in similar form, just, you know, four point loss versus an eight point win there. Um, but again, the Melbourne and Melbourne factor is a huge one. Right, let's get straight into it at the back. As I said, unchanged lineup. So we've got Tane Tuopiki, who's got another chance here. A lot of people during the week, you know, over the weekend there after the game on Friday, calling for Tane to lose his spot, put RTS at the back. If I'm honest, I probably, you know, lean towards that myself, just wanting to get some experience there, getting um, RTS in his best position in a really challenging game like this, particularly not wanting to go back to back losses to start the season. Um, I would have liked to seen uh, Adam Pompey or Ali Laotoa come into the starting lineup here, but not to be. I'm going to stick with Webby's call. I'll trust him. So Young Tane's up against um, Pappenhausen. Tane with only six games in NRL, 71 there for Pappenhausen, but he's had a pretty quiet couple of years with all those injuries, so he hasn't played a lot of footy. That said, he's looking pretty solid at, despite a couple of um, uncharacteristic errors from against the uh, Panthers there. So Tane played 72 minutes last week for 203 metres, um, 35 post-contact, six tackle breaks, which was good. Six tackles at 100%. Um, very similar in size, these two guys, not much of a difference at all. Um, Pappenhausen last in 80 again, so that's great for him. I hate the storms, but I do like that guy, and I really feel for him with all those injuries he's had recently, so it is good to see him back. He only ran for 118 metres, but 45 post-contact. Just the two tackle breaks, just the three tackles at 100% for him as well, but three uncharacteristic errors. So ordinarily, you'd be a little bit worried about this one here, but, you know, Tame was pretty solid. He didn't drop any balls. I thought he really carried himself well, but perhaps struggled to link as well as he did um, in the Dolphins game in particular. I thought he chimed into the line very well there. Um, and pretty much the same kind of distribution role we see from Chance. However, he did struggle a bit against the Sharks here. Going to have to give this a slight nudge towards Pappenhausen, even though he's coming off the back of a lot of injuries, that experience, that explosiveness. One of the best players in the comp when he's on his form. So big challenge there for young Tane. I hope he goes well. Then on our right wing, we've got Dallin Watani as Lesniak. Had a solid game, but probably not his best ever on Friday night up against the big massive Will Warbrick. Um, 190 games versus 26, complete different ends of their uh, playing career. Walbrook coming from Rugby Union there, but he's made a really strong um, transition into league gear. Huge man at a metre 93 and 105 kgs. So with a pretty strong size advantage over Dallin there, expect them to be kicking a few high balls over to that side, but we all know that Dallin is pretty bloody good in the air. 
Um, both playing 80 minutes last week. Dallin running for 151 meters, 42 post contact, one line break and six tackle breaks. Eight tackles there at 80% and four errors, which is uncharacteristic for him. Up against what Woolworth put out, 128 metres, 39 post contact, which you'd expect a bit more for a guy as big and as fast as he is. Um, just the one tackle break too, five tackles, 63%. I think he had four misses and two errors himself. So both of these guys are going to be looking to tidy up their game and eliminate those errors. But I'm really hopeful our um, shape out to the right is going to be a little bit more um, concise this week. A little less clunky that it's going to be a lot of pressure on Walbrook here. He's not the greatest defender in the world. He's still learning to hold, you know, or read those league patterns. So I'm hoping that Dallin can exploit that and use his experience to get one up and over him. Then we go into the centres. This will be an interesting battle here with uh, Rocco Berry up against Remus Smith. Rocco Berry with 32 games under his belt now, up against 106 and from Smith. Man, I didn't realise he's been around that long. Um... Remus Smith, though, I never realized he's as big as he is, 100, a meter 96. That's as big as Tohu, height-wise, um, up against Rocco Berry, who's a meter 91, so he's not a small guy either. Both playing 80 minutes last week. Um, what do you got there? 125 meters from Rocco with 42 post contact. I really want to see him continue that trend. I'd love to see him get up around 150. I think that was a lot of people's bugbear last year. He just didn't make those um, tough meters, but he sure did it on Friday. Um, and just the 93 metres um, for Smith at 28 post-contact metres, but up against some pretty solid centres there for the Panthers. Um, two tackle breaks, one line break assist, 24 tackles at 89% for Rocco. Uh, one try, um, came close to getting two actually, Remus. Um, three tackle breaks, 12 tackles at 86%, and two errors as well. So they're back five really struggling with the errors. Um, last weekend up against the Panthers. Look, experience-wise, you know, he might not be one of those guys who's often talked about as one of the top centers in the game, but he is very solid. And like I said, with that height, he's going to be a challenge. But um, Rocco, more than capable of dealing with these bigger guys, um, you know, starting to be a little bit more physical. So I think this is going to be a really interesting matchup that can Rocco find a little space there and give Dallin some quality ball? Um, it could be one of our opportunities to, here to exploit, but no easy matchups when you're coming up against a storm. And on the other centre, we've got RTS up against Nick Meany. Like I said, a lot of talk there trying to get um, Ro Roger to start at the back there, but hey, I think if we can really get him to um, fire like he did in his earlier games in the trials there, um, I think there's still a lot of upside to Roger playing on the scene and playing in the centres, but he's really got to get that distribution going. It was 22 runs last week and only about three passes, so Montoya starved a lot of quality ball there. Um, so Roger, 196 games, only four games away from his 200, 114 for Nick Meany, so he's a pretty solid um, player when it comes to experience. Both guys playing 80 minutes last week. Um, not too dissimilar in size, Roger being a little bit heavier, but a little bit shorter, meaning being slightly taller. Man, there's a lot of guys around 190 centimetres, if not over, in the Storm's bloody back line. Um, last week, Roger, even though he seemed to have a quiet game, 173 metres with 67 post contact, five tackle breaks, um, nine tackles for 90%, the two errors. But I think he still managed to put that step on and beat um, Ramian, I think it was six times, even though it didn't really lead to a line break because their cover defense closed him up. He's got to get that step going and get those other guys when they jam in and get that ball out to Montoya because he's going to have a lot of open space out there. Um, 166 meters from Meany, which is um, a lot of meters considering he's not the biggest guy in the Storm's back line. Um, for 67 post-contact metres, so very similar to Roger there. Just the one tackle break, 20 tackles at 83%, so um, a couple of misses there for him and three errors as well. Man, there were some errors in both teams' uh, back lines last week. So, look, I don't expect RTS to have that kind of game twice in a row. I think he's learnt, he will have learnt um, from last weekend's experience. I really hope he can start to, to link up better with Montoya. Um because he will definitely draw a lot of attention, but Nick Meany is a very solid defender ordinarily, even though he, only, he was only at 83% last week. So 
I'm going to back my man Roger if uh, Webby's keen to keep him at centre. I reckon he's going to fire up and have close to a man of a match game. Then on the left wing, we've got Montoya up against Xavier Coast. Two massive units here. Meter 89, 95 versus 194 centimetres. Um, and 108 kgs. Man, that's a solid boy to have out on the wing there, particularly with the speed he's got. But we know that uh, Montoya is keen for a confrontation. You know, he doesn't back down from a physical challenge, but he's going to have to be bloody good in the air this week. Uh, 180 games there, 188 games for Montoya now, and 114 for Coates. So both very experienced here, but Coates obviously with a bit more rep footy under him. 105 meters only for uh, Montoya last week. I'd like to see another 50 or so out of him. And just a 27 post contact, which is, a, again, quite low for, for Montoya. Up against 158 metres and 81 post contact. Man, that's some serious post contact metres. Um, what have we got here? One tackle break, three tackles at 100%, which I'm happy about. Um, versus one try assist, three tackle breaks, five tackles, 83%. So a couple of misses there as well. And the one error. Man, the errors are us in the uh, Storm's back line. You wouldn't imagine that's going to happen again. But look, if I'm really honest, I I think uh, Montoya's going to have his hands full here. Um, Xavier Coates, one of the best wings in the comp. Can't stand the guy because he plays for the Storm and for the bloody uh, Reds or the Maroons, I should say. So, yeah, but I'd really love to see Montoya just have a really massive game and lift those meters up, put a couple of solid shots on him, both with and without the ball here. But... Slide edge to bloody uh, coach for the bench. Then we get into 5 8 uh, We've got Luke Metcalf, rumoured to have signed another two years with the Warriors. Another great sign there. Hopefully he'll be keen to prove himself and show that that was the right decision. Up against Jonah Pezzett, um, you know, 20 games in for Metcalf. He's hardly a veteran, but only eight games there for Pezzett. But yet again, the bloody storm seemed to pull these quality halves out of their ass when they need them, so... Um, I think he's been playing you know, bloody well for them in the games that he has got for them. And uh, unfortunately, not a huge drop down from Munster, who hasn't been in the best form of his life last season, but still, I'm glad he's not there. Size-wise, basically exactly the same, though um, Metcalf with a couple of extra kgs that he's put on over the off-season. So hopefully that sort of helps him with his defense. But again, you know, five eights don't generally tend to come up directly against each other. Uh, one try last week for uh, Metcalf, which is great to see that X factor that everyone's been looking for. Um, 72 running meters, just one post contact. That's so random. I think I'm right with that. Um, 50 meters kicking, so he'd only put in a couple there, which is a lot less than he did during the um, trials there. Three tackle breaks, one line break, 20 tackles at 83%, but some very big tackles in those. Um, one on one shots up against middle forwards running at him. Um, 80 minutes last week, just a 55 running meters, 14 post contact, 222 kicking meters, so he took a fair share of the kicking. Um, one try assist, one tackle break, 19 tackles at 90%, and one error. The errors continue for the storm. So, look, Metcalf as well, he's got to get his link play, play going a little better. Um, you know, it was a little bit rusty there, but I thought his defense. That individual brilliance was great last week. I'd like to see him take a little bit more of the kicking, but that's probably a thing that um, SJ's trying to get from him there. Um, but yeah, I think it's going to be a pretty even matchup. We've got a slight uh, sniff here for Metcalf off the back of his re-signing. Radio, the halfbacks, Sean Johnson up against Jerome Hughes, the two Kiwi internationals, both highly experienced. 253 games for SJ, 128 for Jerome Hughes. Both players playing 80 minutes last week. SJ with a 2 from 2 conversions, 113 running metres, just a 6 post contact, 500 metres kicked, which is slightly down on his average. Um, one tackle break, 19 tackles at 76%. Um, 80 minutes for Jerome Hughes last week, 118 metres. Quite similar there with just 16 post contact himself. 413 kicking metres, so... A little bit behind SJ, but we saw that they do split the uh, kicking between their halves. One tackle break, 19 tackles, 76%. Both very similar size guys. So um, I think he's one of their key players that we really need to take care of early. We've got to put a lot of traffic down his way. He doesn't shirk from the uh, tackling the big fellas, but we've got to try and tire him out, put a lot of pressure on him because if he's in control, he's a bloody hard guy to compete against. So it's going to be up to SJ 
to really get our forwards running at him. We want to see SJ dominating, getting his link play a lot better, getting those passes on the button, not throwing them to people's sides or behind them. Couple on the ground there, um, uncharacteristic. Geez, I think whoever really steps up and has the best game out of these two will decide it, and I honestly can't split them. And then into the forwards, Adam Fanua Blake up against Tui Kamakamitha. 160 games for Adam now, 93 for Tui. Similarly sized guys, 189 centimeters, but 123 kgs for Adam. Up against Tui, he was a meter 95 and 110. I figure I struggle to see how he is actually that much smaller than Adam when you see those photos of him with his shirt off over the offseason. Man, he looks like a rock. Um, 56 minutes for Adam, one try, which is a, a very solid Adam for Noah Blake. Uh, try there, smashing it over in the in the first quarter. 220 run meters, 61 post contact, slightly down as far as post contact goes. One line break, uh, sorry, two line breaks. One of them was absolutely outstanding, almost went you know, 50 meters for the try there. Six tackle breaks, 23 tackles at 100% tackle efficiency. Um, 132 running meters from Tui, 67 post contact. So very similar post contact meters, but a lot less overall meters run. One tackle break, 25 tackles and 89%. So both having a very big impact on um, their respective forward packs. Adam playing slightly less minutes than you normally expect. By all accounts, he wasn't happy about that. Um, Tui probably playing around the, the similar numbers he normally would. I think it's a big out not having to deal with Nelson this week. Um, but these two here will be a big confrontation. I would have thought Adam would have dominated those Sharks props. But they stepped up and matched him um, in the middle there. So really curious to see how these two go. But I'm hoping Adam gets up on it. Then we get to hookers. I'm hugely surprised to see Wade Egan named here, but Chanel Harris-Tavita named on the extended bench, reportedly training at hooker this week, um, who I wouldn't be surprised to see slot into the 14, and Freddie Lusick moving to the uh, starting lineup, which frustrates a few people, but I say give Freddie some time. I don't think his pass is as bad as a lot of people say. It was just the depth of it, passing a little bit too far behind the advantage line. Get that a little bit flatter, get that little bit of running meters going, put the de defense in two minds. Great defense from him as well. So that said, I'd really like to see Chanel get some time if Wade is out. I think he could be a bit of a revelation there. Up against Harry Grant, arguably the best hooker in the competition at the moment. Um, so Wade with 110 games now versus 79. Jeez, Harry seems like he's been around for longer than that. Last week, just the 34 minutes for Egan with his injury versus 71. So we know that um, Grant does play big minutes there. Uh, 22 run meters for 8 post contact versus 59 run meters for 27 post contact for Harry Grant. Like I've always said, I love the way he links up with his players. He doesn't die with the ball. Need to see a bit more of that from Wade Egan. Um, what have got? One line break, one try assist, 18 tackles for 100% and just his 34 minutes. Man, there's some big numbers there on his tackling. Um, versus 3 tackle breaks, 43 tackles at 83% from Harry Grant, so he certainly gets through a power of work. Um, both similarly sized guys with Egan with a bit more height. Uh, shit, I would say he's 50-50 to play, um, Egan. I don't know if you risk him, if it could potentially cause a longer-term injury, but they know better than I do. So if he plays, I think he's more than capable of matching Harry Grant, but if he doesn't play, it's going to be a huge ask for the likes of Freddie Lusick and potentially Chanel off the bench. So at the moment, I'm going to have to give Harry Grant a slight edge on this one. Then propping on the other side, um, apparently Mitch Barnett in the pink vest this week at training, on, well, particularly on Monday there, which meant he was in non-contact. So he may be carrying a bit of a niggle there. Um, up against Josh King, both similar amount of experience here, 144 games versus 130. Um 51 minutes from Barnett last week, 174 metres, 54 post contact, one tackle break, 26 tackles at 90%. I think it was a, a solid without being outstanding game from Mitch, but like I said, I really did like the leadership he showed. I do like the aggression he shows when we really need to man up and try and keep the opposition on their try line. He's always the one who leads that charge. Um, Josh King there, what did he play? 48 minutes last week, 75 metres, um, completely different amount of meters there. 34 post contact, one tackle break, 29 tackles for 97%, and one offload. Um, 
Josh King's an interesting one. Like he's never really that guy who stands out, but he's often in people's super coach sides, and you know he's just niggly, doesn't go away. Stats obviously don't reflect his impact on the game because um, Mitch blows him out of the water in his work rate for a similar amount of minutes, but I expect him to be niggly. I expect him to be in there. He's got solid defense, um, just a, a very you know, solid workhorse. So I'd hope that Mitch Barnett will be okay and that he'll get a little bit of an edge over uh, King and give us a bit of forward momentum there. Then we get on to the edges. Um, Jackson Ford here on the right-hand edge up against Joe Chang. Um, a lot of shit against um, or said about uh, Jackson and his errors. Mate, I defend him, but they aren't acceptable. I really hope he's been working on that this week. But also I hope that we get those passes to him in the bread basket, not a little bit low. He's had 58 games now, so you know, really starting to come of age. Up against two games there for Joe Chang, but he's a bit of a young prodigy. Solid boy at a metre 90 and 94 kgs. But Jackson a little bit more um, heavy there, but a bit shorter. Uh, 80 minutes from Jackson last week versus 64 for Joe Chang. Uh, Jackson with 110 metres, 40 post contact, but all very, um, you know, tough metres that he made in the weekend. No, no bloody line breaks or anything, just straight up the guts. Uh, what did I say? One line break, 38 tackles at 95%, but those three errors. Uh, 58 metres for Joe Chang and... 18 metres post-contact, five tackle breaks, though. I think he had the most out of any of the Storm. Uh, 29 tackles at 97%. So he's, a, like I said, a young prodigy, but there is an opportunity for us to put a bit of work his way and maybe try and put him off his game. Um, that said, Jackson really needs to lift his. Lift his. So this will be an interesting matchup. I really believe Jackson's going to step up this week and make up for what he did last week. I expect him to be about up around 130 running metres and probably around... You know, 45 tackles, but most of all, playing the Storm in Melbourne, you can't give away silly ruck penalties, can't hold them down, those pricks will get away with it all night, we won't, we've just got to be smarter and we've just got to hold that ball, Jackson, if you can do that, I think you can win this matchup. Then, another surprising inclusion for me, um, you know, I've never done rib cartilage, I don't know, but it's usually a, one of those ones you've got to let settle, otherwise it just doesn't go away. Kurt Capewell comes back in, 140 games for him up against Ali Katoa, the former Warrior, 68 games in now. One of those players that I always wish we'd never let go, um, you know, accused of attitude issues at the time, you know, a few niggly like um, errors in his game as well, but I think he's really come of age over at the Storm, so this would be a good matchup. A uh, much more dynamic player there, and Ali, like he's a monster, metre 93 versus a metre 89, 10 more kg on him. But I think Kurt Capewell, as long as he can deal with that pain, I'm sh sure he's going to be getting a few injections. He'll be ready to go and be more than a match for young Ali. 66 minutes for Capewell. He's usually an 80-minute man, but he went for 50 metres and 16 post-contact. 33 tackles at 97%. But like I said in my post-game review, he just has a bigger impact than his numbers reflect. Um, I'm really hoping he is, he is ready to go because he'll make a big difference. Um, Ali Katoa, the 122 metres, 52 points, contact, three tackle breaks, 36 tackles. He's really got a solid work ethic there on defence at 80%. Uh, but we know he can run a solid line, and he's, he's bloody hard to tackle when he's busting over that line. So Capewell's going to have his work cut out for him. But I think, as like I said, if the pain can be controlled, I think he should be able to get one up over Ali here. Then we get into locks. Tohu Harris, the 221-game man. Versus Trent Liero, who's 50 games in. Tohu playing 80 minutes last week. Again, like he's just an absolute workhorse for his age. 60 minutes for Liero there. 237 metres for Tohu. 86 po uh, 82 post contact. 37 tackles and 97%. Crazy. Um, up against Trent Liero there with only 86 metres. Only 34 post contact. 36 tackles, a similar amount there at 95%, but you've got to think Tohu's going to have a bigger impact on our game, but so often I say that, and these guys who kind of go a little bit under the radar, you hear his name a lot, but he's not a superstar, they often step up and match us, so I hope Tohu can really get one over him and set the tone. I'm looking for some big leadership here. It's a little bit quiet for me when we were on our back foot last week, so really want to see him get a little bit more vocal with the boys. 
Righty, on to the benches. So Freddie Lusick, like I said, a lot of talk that he would start. A lot of people were thinking he should be dropped. For me, I'm happy with him there. I think he's going to continue to develop. So many of us gave, gave Wade Egan shit back in the day before we realized what he had, you know, the potential he had and once we gave him time to develop. So I'm not going to be quick to dismiss this guy. I think he's still a little bit ahead of anyone else there. That said, Chanel may really surprise us. Um, Tom Elliott there, no game time last week, so he'll be fresh and ready to go. He's had a 26 game so far, and Bunty R5, a little bit quiet, limited minutes last week, but he's up to almost his uh, 130th, well, he is 130th game this week. So I think, you know, if he's ever going to step up, it's got to be now, and Dylan Walker gets the uh, 17 jersey game with 118 games. So we've got a hooker who can play in the middle there where needed. We've got two props who can potentially play a bit of 13 and Dylan Walker who's a middle hooker at a push and can cover backs um, one concerning thing for me here though is with Capewell carrying that injury I don't really like the idea of Dylan Walker being the edge cover there but like I said Webby knows better than me uh, for the Storm bench we've got Tyron Wishout with 30 games Christian Welsh with 144 Chris Lewis 42 and Alec McDonald with 23 so we've got Listed as a half there, Tyron Wishaw, but he plays a lot at hooker, um, plays in the middle. He can pretty much play anywhere in the in the team room. Just so bloody quick, very reliable, just another one of those bloody niggly storm guys that they seem to find. Um, reminds me a lot of his father, who was a great winger back in the day. And you've got a prop in Welsh there, um, who will come in and hold his middle. Um, and you've got a uh, edge back row there in Lewis, and McDonald, who's a, who's a lock. Shit, I'd love to say that our bench has, has got a lot more there, but very similar for you. And if I'm honest, I just really like Wishart off the bench. Um, if Chanel does end up coming into that 14, I like it a lot more. Um, I really hope he does get a game in some ways. I don't want to lose Egan, but I want to see Chanel step up and show that he's more than capable of playing hooker because I love his energy, his ability to hit, and his, and his versatility there at 14 over... Lusik is a little bit one-dimensional. Um, I'm not going to put this up there, but just having a quick look at particularly our extended bench there, we have Adam Pompey at 18, then Jazz, Tamari Martin, Ali Leotoa, and Chanel harris Vita. They've got Sean Bloor, Braley, Sevi, Falongo, and Moyeroa. Um, I'm not going to touch on them too much, but I'm going to touch on the fact that... Uh, we don't have any edge cover, even in our bench, as I said. So I really do hope that Capewell is right. Um, I'm not sure. I really want to see um, Walker go there. One option is potentially to move up um, Tohu to an edge. Um, a lot of questions about that one for me. It's interesting they continue to play Adam Pompey at um, 18. I guess that's because he can play a few positions in the back line. Anyway... We're coming off the back of a loss with a bunch of guys who are battered up, but I'm so stoked to see that we've got a pretty close to full strength lineup there, minus perhaps Marata and maybe for me Jazz on the bench there instead of Ari and Bunty. Um, however, the Storm looking strong as ever. They don't seem to have that many bloody superstars other than in their spine, but they've just got guys that do a job, and like I said, they're all huge bastards. So we've got our work cut out for us, but I believe. If we can play close to our best footy and the Storms play like they did in the weekend with those 15 errors, I think we take advantage of more opportunities than we did last week and we've got a sneaky chance. But shit, I wouldn't be putting anyone's left nut on this. I'm going to trust Webby. I'm going to trust that these boys are going to be able to make it with maybe a needle and I think we're going to sneak away with a two-point victory despite probably getting another shit sandwich from the refs. Up the Mighty Warriors. Let me know what you think in the comments. Hit that like and subscribe button if you haven't done so so far. It really does help kick things off. Let's go. 2024 well underway. <laughs>